So folks, over the last few questions, we've dealt with uh, this original matrix differential equation here. We first looked at it as a system of linear differential equations. We then wrote it in this matrix form. We then computed its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And then at last, we were able to give the general solution to this uh, original uh, matrix differential equation. What we'd like to do now is look at something called the phase portrait of this solution. And the phase portrait is a way of looking at the two different um, states that this uh, system can have. That is, we're going to think of having an x1 of t uh, axis and an x2 of t axis. And uh, we'll erase this point, but let's plot it here for just a second. If we were at this point in the phase portrait and say this were the ordered pair uh, 4, 5, that would correspond to saying that x1 of a particular t naught value is equal to 4, and x2 of a particular t naught value is equal to 5. So for example, if we're over here, then we'd be in the situation where x1 of t is negative, because we're to the left of, we're, we're on the negative uh, x1 of t axis, and x2 of t would be positive. So that's how we interpret those phase portraits. And we haven't done a whole lot with them in this course, because they haven't had a whole lot of uh, meaning just yet for what we've been working with, but now they will. So what I'd like to do is sketch this phase portrait. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to sketch the eigenvectors. When I sketch these eigenvectors, I'm going to go ahead and draw them as we normally draw vectors. So here's the vector uh, negative 1, 1, and I'll draw that vector. Now I'm labeling that vector with an arrow, but I want you to be cautious about that because that's that's just because we often draw vectors with arrows on them. And normally what I will do is I will not put a directional arrow on the vector so I don't confuse it with the flow line arrow for the states of the system. I'll explain what I mean as we go along. We have the second vector. We've got the vector 1, 2. That's this eigenvector right here. So now that we've sketched the eigenvectors, I want to look at that general solution and remember how the general solution has two as a yet undetermined coefficients that we decide based on the initial conditions of the original ODE. And if one of these coefficients were zero, then we just have the other contributing solution to the uh, differential equation. So let's just say if C2 is equal to zero, then what we find out is that x would be C1 e to the 3t times the vector minus 1, 1. And it may be a little bit hard to think about this because we're just getting used to this idea. This is saying the same thing as um, x1 of t is equal to negative c1 e to the 3t, where I got that negative sign when I scalar multiplied uh, this coefficient function to the eigenvector's first coordinate. And my x2 of t would be a positive c1 e to the 3t. So these are the two solutions. So notice that as t increases, the values of x1 and x2 change, but they change along this same trajectory vector here, negative 1, 1. In this case, then, the solutions would lie on the span of the eigenvector minus 1, 1. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, uh, in a different color, draw the span of that, that eigenvector. And that's, that's good enough. Uh, I don't want to put any arrows on that span because I'm going to assign direction to the flow here in just a minute. So notice now, as t approaches infinity, um, we're going to take our initial vector and stretch it. So the initial vector is stretched. away from the origin. Why is that? Well, it has everything to do with the uh, sign of the eigenvalue. Okay? So let's suppose that my initial condition for C1 was such that I ended up with this as my initial state. Now remember that the state has to do with the, the point where that vector falls, and that corresponds to having this as your initial you know, x1 value, and this is your initial x2 value. So if these were populations, for instance, this would be maybe the population of the rabbits would be uh, this value here, and the population of the foxes would be maybe this value here. Well, if this is my initial ve vector, 
what happens to that vector as t approaches infinity? As t approaches infinity, the scalar being multiplied to that vector is going to increase. So as t approaches infinity, that vector is going to be stretched out further and further. So I'm now going to assign flow lines moving away from the origin. And the reason why those flow lines are moving away from the origin has everything to do with the sign on that eigenvalue there. Let's suppose our initial position vector, or initial vector in the system, were maybe in this direction here. That would correspond to having this as my x1 initial state, and this is my x2 initial state. Well, again, as t approaches infinity, the scalar that we're multiplying to the vector minus 1, 1, even though because of c1 we're pointing in the opposite direction that we were before, the scalar is going to cause the, ma the, 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 um, the scalar is going to increase as t increases in absolute value, stretching this vector away from the origin. Okay. So as t goes to infinity, what happens to these coefficients? They get large in the absolute value sense, stretching the vectors away from the origin. Now, if the eigenvalue were negative, then as t approaches infinity, these scalars would be shrinking down towards zero, and our vectors would be moving towards the origin. But in this case, because we have this positive eigenvalue, we're being stretched away from the origin. Same thing, then, if we look at the case where the first coefficient is zero. Then our solution would just look like x is equal to uh, c2 e to the 2t times the vector 1, 2. And again, that's a little bit hard. We're just getting used to this. What I'm saying here is that it would correspond to the solution x1 of t is equal to uh, c1 e to the 2t, and x2 of t is equal to 2c1 e to the 2t. So notice what happens if we're on, uh, if we take an initial vector along this, uh, the span of this second eigenvector. So let's see here, here's that second eigenvector span. I don't want to put any arrows on it just yet. And if I go ahead and put an initial vector on it, what's going to happen to that initial vector as t goes to infinity? Well, as t goes to infinity, the scalar that I'm multiplying to this vector, which is the c2 e to the 2t, as t goes to infinity, that scalar is going to become larger. And as I multiply that larger and larger scalar to this vector, it's just going to stretch that vector further away from the origin. The same is true even if my initial vector had been pointing in the opposite direction. So in terms of our um, solution here, that would be if we had a negative c2 value, then the initial vector would be pointing in this direction because it's a negative value times e to the 2 times 0 times this eigenvector. But that's going to reflect that eigenvector over the, uh, in the opposite direction. And so now as t gets large, what happens? Well, as t gets large, e to the 2t becomes large. That scalar just becomes larger in magnitude. If it was already negative, it becomes a larger negative number that I'm multiplying to that initial vector 1, 2, and that's going to stretch me further in this direction. So I can now assign uh, flow arrows on the spans of each of those distinct um, eigenvectors uh, moving away from the origin. So to shortcut that, the reason why we do that is because the eigenvalues here were positive in both these cases. So we have air flow arrows away from the origin. Now one thing I recommend always doing is for each one of these uh, eigenvectors that we sketch, let's go ahead and label the corresponding eigenvalue. So here was the eigenvector negative 1, 1, which gave us um, this span right here, we've now assigned the flow arrows to it. But let's go ahead and label this as corresponding to lambda is equal to 3. And then here for the eigenvector 1, 2, we went ahead and sketched the span of that eigenvector. And then we assigned flow arrows based on the sign of the eigenvalue. And that was eigenvalue lambda is equal to 2. So for our second step there, we went ahead and assigned the flow arrows on the span of each of those eigenvectors. And the direction of the flow arrow depended upon the sign of the eigenvalue. The last step is to go ahead and put 
um, general flow lines on your face portrait. So this step is maybe the hardest step to explain, and we'll get more practice with it in class. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to imagine that we were in some particular state of this system here. So let's suppose, for instance, that we were in, say, this state right here. Now remember, being at this point corresponds to having this much uh, of x1 and this much of x2. So if these were, say, populations of rabbits and foxes, we would have whatever this coordinate is, number of rabbits, and whatever this coordinate is, number of foxes. So that's the state that we're in. And so from that state, we would have that our, that our solution is some c1, we've got some c1 there, e to the 3t, negative 1, 1, plus some c2, e to the 2t, uh, times that solution, e to the 2t vector 1, 2. So what's going to happen as time elapses. Well, as time approaches infinity, we've got both of we've got many different contributing factors to the solution. We've got the initial conditions c1 and c2. We've got the eigenvectors one and uh, minus one one and one two. But as t is approaching infinity, eventually the behavior of the solution is going to be dictated by this e to the lambda t term or this e to the lambda t term. And the question is, is which one is going to sort of dominate the way the solution looks? Well, e to the 3t as t approaches infinity becomes far larger than e to the 2t as t approaches infinity. So as t approaches infinity, the e to the 3t factor dominates. Which means that as t approaches infinity, we're going to start moving closer in alignment with the eigenvector that corresponds to that larger eigenvalue. So here we have t is moving in this direction. As t is approaching infinity, we're going to start moving more and more in alignment with the eigenvector, uh, in this case the vector negative 1, 1, that has the larger eigenvalue. And you'll notice I labeled each of these uh, spans with their eigenvalue. So I become, as t approaches infinity, more parallel to the eigenvector with the larger eigenvalue. Then, as t approaches negative infinity, well, first of all, where is our solution going to end up? As t approaches negative infinity, x is going to tend to just the zero vector. Does that make sense? Let's see here. As t approaches negative infinity, this coefficient starts to approach zero. Likewise, this coefficient starts to approach zero. So as t approaches negative infinity, the each of the coefficients being multiplied to each of the eigenvectors is approaching zero, so x, the state, is approaching the zero vector. But the question is, is as t approaches uh, negative infinity, what survives? Well, this term right here, the c1 e to the minus 3t, is going to die off faster because of that larger eigenvalue than this term will die off. So the c2 e to the 2t will survive will have be contributing more to the overall state of the system than the e to the minus 3t as our t value approaches negative infinity. So the e to the uh, 2t survives. I'll put survives longer if that, that might kind of help. And we're going to clarify this more in class, folks. But the, the effect of that is that as t approaches negative infinity, first of all, we're approaching the state uh, right here, 0, 0. That's the, uh, uh, as t is approaching negative infinity, we're approaching the state 0, 0. But as we do so, we come in becoming more and more parallel to the smaller uh, positive eigenvalue. So as t is approaching negative infinity, this component of the solution is dying off faster, and this component still remains. And so our solution should be more and more parallel to this eigenvector right here. So let me go ahead now and sketch a few more flow lines to this. So for example, I might have this flow line right here, and over here we'll have something that looks like this, and this flow line right here. So again, let me put a couple more on here. Let's see here, here we'd have this flow line, and this flow line, and this flow line, and this flow line. And I am assigning directions of motion to this 
uh, that direction corresponds to positive time. So notice that as t approaches infinity, the solutions become parallel to, sorry, let me say that again. As t approaches infinity, the solutions become parallel to the eigenvector with the larger eigenvalue. So the solutions become parallel to the eigenvector with the greatest eigenvalue. Okay. Likewise, as t approaches negative infinity, the solutions become parallel to the eigenvector with the smaller positive eigenvalue. Let's see, let me put a different color there. As t approaches negative infinity, the solutions become parallel to the eigenvector with the smaller um, eigenvalue. Actually, folks, I should say, rather than smaller, be more precise, I should say lesser eigenvalue. So, folks, this is one kind of a messy diagram, uh, and this was a little challenging. We're going to be able to go through these more uh, succinctly in later examples. I did a lot of explanation here. But just to summarize, the first thing we did was we sketched our eigenvectors. We then assigned flow arrows on the span of each of those eigenvectors, depending on the sign of the eigenvalue. So that's what gave me these um, blue, these lines are called separatrix. These blue separatrix lines, the spans of each of those eigenvectors. I labeled them by their eigenvalues, and then I assigned the direction of flow. When the eigenvalues are positive, we flow outwards. Then we have to put our, the third step is to put our generic curves on there. And that is more challenging. And the idea is, is that as t approaches infinity, we become parallel to the eigenvector with the greater eigenvalue. And as t approaches negative infinity, our curves need to become parallel to the eigenvector with the lesser eigenvalue. This is, of course, assuming that we don't have repeated eigenvalues. Uh, nor do we have complex eigenvalues in this problem. Those cases will be more complicated. Regardless, folks, if you're feeling a little overwhelmed with this, that's okay. This was a first pass at this topic, and we will pick it up in class. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.